masculinizing the brain. Testosterone, as you know, is produced uh, much more by males than females because it's produced by the testes in males, in females by the adrenal glands, and to some extent by the ovaries. And it can be carried by the blood and crosses the barrier, the blood-brain barrier, into the brain. And across the body, it binds to androgen receptors, which is how it does its work. And all of the regions in the brain which differ between males and females are particularly rich in androgen receptors. So um, this, this is how we have the clue that testosterone, a hormone, may be very important in brain development. And what's uh, thought to be the mechanism is that um, once it's bound to androgen receptors, it can affect levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin, I mentioned earlier, GABA is another one, and it can also affect connections between neurons in a process called apoptosis, or selective cell death in the brain. So these are the reasons why we are measuring testosterone to understand how it affects typical sex differences. This is the, um, the first result to show you, which is that when you sample that fluid that's surrounding the baby in the amniotic sac, you do indeed find differences in the amount of hormone produced by boys and girls. So here we have boys in blue and girls in red, and you can see boys' testosterone levels are much higher than girls. But what I wanted to highlight was the variability, because you can see that there are some boys who are in the low female range, but there are some girls who are in the male range. That means that there are significant individual differences in how much of this hormone people produce. The other thing to notice here is the, um, the variability even within one sex. So if we just look at the boys, this is a huge variability. In fact, the differences are 20-fold within the boys. Some are very low, some are very high in how much testosterone they produce. So the design of this study is asking the question, if you ignore somebody's gender and just look at how much testosterone was in the amniotic fluid in the womb, and then you follow up the babies later, does this have any effect on later behavior? So here's the summary of the, of the study. We measured the testosterone between the 12th and the 19th week of pregnancy when women were having an amniocentesis. We then asked the mothers, after their baby was born, to bring the baby into our lab. At their first birthday, we looked at eye contact. At their second birthday, we looked at their language development, how vocabulary was developing. At four years old, when the child was starting school, we looked at the quality of their social relationships. And now these children, we've been following them, are eight years old, and we can look at their empathy, at their systemizing, at how they do on those tests of attention to detail, and also their number of autistic traits. Each time the question is the same, is there any relationship between how much testosterone they produced in the womb and how, how their behavior is in childhood? And I want to remind you that this study is not on children with autism, it's on typically developing children whose mothers happened to have an amnio because it gives us an opportunity to study the hormone at the right point in development. You can't go back later to find out what it was like uh, in the womb. So we've got an opportunity when the women are having uh, amniocentesis during pregnancy to follow these children forwards. So what did we find? Well, when we saw the children at their first birthday, we measured their eye contact by inviting the child to play with toys, and we filmed the child whilst they're playing. But later, we looked at the videotapes to see how often does the child look up at their mother's face. The mother is seated at the side of the room, and we ask the mother not to initiate any social interaction, but simply to respond if the child initiates. What we could see is in 10 minutes, um, girls were making more eye contact than boys. And this is 
a result that's been found in many studies that girls pay more attention to faces than boys. But at the bottom of this slide, you can see the relationship with testosterone levels. So here we have girls in red and boys in blue. And we've got testosterone along this axis and how much eye contact they make along this axis. What you can see is that the line is downwards, meaning the higher your testosterone levels in the womb, the less eye contact you make at your first birthday. When we got this result, uh, we were really quite startled, quite surprised, because we had no real expectation that a molecule, a chemical like testosterone, would really affect how much eye contact you make. Most people would imagine that eye contact was purely under the control of social factors, like your birth order, whether you're a firstborn or a later born, the number of siblings you have, whether one or both parents are working outside the home, so how much attention you're receiving. But what this study showed is that over and above the influence of those factors, prenatal testosterone was also influencing how much eye contact a child makes. At their second birthday, we again invited the children to come into our lab, but this time we looked at their, their language development. We asked the mothers to fill in a questionnaire of how many words does your child know or produce. So it's a checklist of vocabulary. Sorry, and what you can see here is that girls had a larger vocabulary compared to boys. So girls were talking earlier and developing their language faster than boys. Again, this is a result that's been known about for a long time, that, um, that boys start talking later than girls. The real question is, why? And here we had the opportunity to look back at their testosterone levels. And once again, we found that the slope of the line is downwards. That means there's a negative correlation the higher your fetal testosterone levels, the slower you are to develop language. So this hormone seems to be involved not just in social development, eye contact, but also in language development. I'm going to race ahead because of time to tell you the results of how these children are now they're eight years old, because at eight years old we can give them more fancy tests, such as looking at empathy and looking at systemizing, to again see if there's any relationship between prenatal testosterone and these later skills. So here we've given them that test of looking at the eyes, judging other people's emotions. And at the bottom of the slide, we see the relationship with testosterone. Once again, the line, I'm sorry, the line slopes downwards, meaning that the higher your, t your prenatal testosterone, the more difficulties you're having in reading emotions from somebody else's eyes. You can also see that we've given these children the embedded figures test, that a test of attention to detail. So there's the triangle you have to find, and there it is in the overall design. Would the hormone affect how quick children were on this test, and what you can see is that now the line goes upwards, meaning it's a positive correlation. The higher your testosterone levels in the womb, the faster you are on this test of attention to detail. Now the last uh, few slides I want to mention look directly at autism, because um, so far we've been looking at typical development in relation to the hormone but it'd be very interesting to know whether this hormone has anything to do with autism. Well, because these children, let's go back one slide, because these children are all typically developing, and in many of these studies, there are only a few hundred children, you wouldn't expect many cases of autism. But we've asked the parents to fill out a questionnaire which measures autistic traits. And this